listening to the Pharmacy Podcast Network. This is the PGX for Pharmacists podcast. We believe pharmacists are the best positioned providers to lead in PGX. Pharmacogenomics is the study of how genes affect a person's response to drugs. This relatively new field combines pharmacology and genomics to develop effective, safe medications and doses that will be tailored to a person's genetic makeup. This podcast is dedicated to pharmacists with an interest in learning more about the data analytics, industry trends, and evidence-based usage of pharmacogenomics. Welcome to PGX for Pharmacists, part of the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Hi, everyone. My name is Bana Sarami, your host to PGX for Pharmacists podcast on the largest pharmacy podcast in the nation and one of the top 20 podcasts in genomics globally. If you're new to the podcast, I'm a pharmacogenomics medical science liaison and a mentor to pharmacists. Connect with me on LinkedIn and let's get the conversation going. I want to hear from you and how you're impacting patients, payers, or clinicians and what you've learned through your journey to share with us. Being a PGX advocate requires going beyond the certificate and, and reading an actionable report, right? I want to hear from you, so let's connect. PGX for Pharmacists podcast is focused on learning the science behind PGX, since that is where the missing gap is for both providers and pharmacists. And that's the missing gap also, which will push PGX into adoption. We also cover the business side of uh, business side of things along with reimbursement and more. So stay tuned for those episodes. Um, few people uh, with a uh, cause walk the talk as boldly and graciously at Chris, as Christine von Reisfeld, founder and CEO of People with Empathy. Christine is a pillar of patient advocacy and allyship in the rare and chronic disease community. Through the lens of her lived experience in healthcare, she has become a champion for patient voices, diversity, inclusion in research, clinical research, and um, equitable patient sponsor partnership. Christine has brought her unique perspective and owned expertise to countless roles as featured speaker for numerous conferences on topics ranging from clinical trial recruitment to data and digital rights from a true patient perspective. She serves as an e-patient scholar with Stanford Medicine X and a technical expert panelist with CMS, among other roles. So wherever possible, Christine generates momentum towards progress along her patient advocacy interests and has become a thought leader worldwide, stimulating dialogue on a range of topics relevant to patients, clinicians, and industry. As a patient advisor, Christine has assisted several initiatives, including the Stanford Human Wide Precision Medicine Program and the NIH All of Us Research Program, and has also served as a board member and advisor to multiple organizations and startups. For her many contributions to the field, she has been named one of the top 100 women of influence by Silicon Valley Business Journal a member of the 2021 HIMSS Future 50 and one of the uh, Medica's Life 50's most influential voices in healthcare, among other distinctions. Oh my goodness, Christine, your credentials to took over my whole entire podcast. <laughs> I was going to say, I'll like, shorten that. <laughs> how much more can I go? Uh, and I'm probably sure I missed a lot. So I appreciate you taking time to come on the podcast and just enlighten us with who you are and what you do and why you do it. You know, elaborate further sure. on your um, credentials. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's funny that you have that huge list of credentials because growing up, I have, I'm a rare disease and still undiagnosed patient. And so um, growing up with those conditions, I really did feel like I was a burden on society, right? And really just felt like my life wasn't going to amount to much. And just even hearing you and other people read off accomplishments, it's, it's, just kind of shocking to myself. So <laughs> yeah, and I probably just, I probably didn't read all of it. <laughs> yeah. 
It's okay, but I am a patient. And so what I like to tell people is I got into healthcare not because it was a choice, but because it was for my own survival. Um, like I mentioned, I'm a rare disease patient with multiple autoimmune issues, and I'm still undiagnosed looking for the ultimate cause of what's going on. But it's been a struggle, right? Um, you know the problems in our healthcare system. And and really just growing up, there wasn't a lot known. You know, we've gotten to a point in in today's society where research is so easy. You know, I when I was a kid, I remember being 14 years old and taking the bus to Stanford to just the library there, right? Doing research on my conditions. And now we have the internet and we have the ability to really see what's out there. And um yeah, my life has pretty much been this series of unfortunate events with everything that happens in healthcare. Um, but there's positives that have come out of it. And some of those learnings that we've come across in my own personal life, I want to make sure that people hear those stories so that we can apply them to other people. And yes. X is one mm -hmm. of extremely important topics to me. Yes. So um, so continue sharing. Yeah. Let, let yeah. us know. So with uh, so my, you know, you and I connected on LinkedIn, I recently just testified for AB 425, which was a bill to bring pharmacogenomics to Medi-Cal patients. And I'll give you a bit of a brief backstory on where I am and how I got into this precision medicine space. Um, like I said, I had always really just felt like there was nothing for me. Um, and have always been sick. My first surgery was at the age of five and then continued on. At one point in my life, I got a diagnosis for lupus, um, not because of biomarkers or anything, but because I met a series of criteria. And so with that diagnosis, I was given, you know, standard of care. And throughout my life, I have always had random, weird, strange side effects for medications. Um, everything I was taking, you know, I'd stop them at certain points, rashes, reactions, different things, and we never knew why. Um, and it was always something puzzling to me. And so at one point, I was informed that Stanford had a human-wide program, and it was this precision medicine initiative looking to see how patients could help themselves advance their own care. But one of the benefits of that program was a pharmacogenomics test. And I really didn't know much about it, but I had friends who had told me that this was a test that would tell you how you metabolize or broke down these compounds. And it'll tell you how these medications are reacting to you. And so I enrolled in the program. I was one of the last participants uh, uh, that was admitted into the program. One of the last three by chance, thank God. But my results revealed information that even my counselor was shocked at. You know, I had reactions to more than half of the compounds that we had tested and different reactions as well. Some I was a fast metabolizer, some I was a slow metabolizer, and some I was just fine. And again, some with no reaction. And so that really opened my eyes to you know, some of the things that, that were being caused. I have a lot of damage from medications. And you and I talked about this, um, but because of certain medications, I have avascular necrosis, which resulted in three joint replacements. I have, uh, oh gosh, now I can't even think straight. My brain is... <laughs> Oh, no, you're fine. <laughs> a toxic oh, encephalopathy and, and a loss of night vision. And these are all things that now we know could have been prevented by dosing, appropriate dosing for me, you know? And so knowing that and knowing how it changed my own treatment and care really just, you know, I want to make sure people know about it. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. Hearing you and your, again, your accomplishments and I get where you're coming from your accomplishments, how amazing of a woman you are, which is why I connected with you on LinkedIn mm -hmm. and your positivity kind of when you talk, even when we, the first time we spoke in not being bitter or trying to find a solution, all these amazing things you're doing. I, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing is all the best word I can use right now. But <laughs> um, yeah, so well, can I comment really quick? You had mentioned about being bitter, you know, and, and I think I come across a lot of people 
I live my life sick. So there is no bitter in in growing up with an illness, right? You kind of just have to learn how to pivot and and turn. And so I I always I have friends that grew up with illness as well and we're always shocked about people who are are upset, right? Or or because or I think angry, these are, yeah. or angry, right? Mm-hmm. These are life lessons and learnings and I've met some amazing people and and been able to really you know, share these messages. So I don't look at these things as a, as a mistake or an error. I mean, they are right, but I don't blame anyone for it. I think science is evolving. And at the time where I was receiving these treatments, my doctors didn't know that technology wasn't available to us. And the physicians that were helping me, they were like my family, you know? And so I know their intentions were always to help me. It just so happened that this happened. Um, but I think it, it, it's, it's a lesson for all of us. It is, it is. And, uh, you know, you coming and sharing it and you're taking it in a different perspective. It really helps push a lot of things forward. Uh, I know it may seem slow, but mm-hmm. you're helping a lot more people, um, along, along your path. So, so tell us about this, uh, people with, uh, empathy and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my nonprofit. <laughs> yes, yes. So our backstory to the nonprofit, it's a little funny. I grew up in the Bay Area in Silicon Valley and um we were going, I was looking for things to do just to get out there to learn things, to connect with people. And I I attended a lot of networking events out here. And a lot of our networking events were focused on finance and tech and real estate, um, some healthcare, but not with the right conversations. And so my co-founder and I were sitting at a restaurant one night and we were venting. And I said, this world needs more people with empathy. And that's what started our little group. And so we're looking at mm-hmm. connecting, right? Breaking down silos and and really connecting people across different parts of industry because we all have a part in this, right? I think a lot of us don't look holistically at healthcare and, or even just health in general. And it's more of a community kind of effort here. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. And you know, that's great ideas just start with the conversation. And so that that's, and then the name of it, people with empathy, exactly, exactly. It's what it is. So um, and then you talk about research before um, earlier on I, yeah. and tell us why diversity and inclusion is uh, in clinical research is so key. And why does it even matter? Oh, well, I think or, it's... are we even doing that in any clinical research right now? Right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's probably I know, the question. whole healthcare ecosystem. I think I look at it a little differently, you know, um, And maybe that's just from being in different silos and having those different conversations with people in general. Um, But I see I see the way that we're going in medicine as more of a precision medicine and a personalized medicine approach. But I think what people don't understand is in order to get that personalized approach, we also have to take a step back. And so for me, I'm mixed race. I'm half Filipino, German, Irish, and and just kind of a mutt like most of the population out there. Um, But as I've been networking in different groups, we've realized that there are certain conditions that are more prevalent in in different heritages. And, And as we mix our DNA and things like that, I think we have to take a look at genetic mutations and clusters in patients versus disease states, right? I think that as we're looking to do research, we should be looking broader in order to get to that more personalized approach, if that makes any sense to you at all. Yes, no, it does. And so, you know, I I bring that up. It's a very, uh, I don't like to bring it up, but so you, you're you saying we can't look at somebody just like for you and say she falls into Caucasian or a white or the race because yeah. you have, you come from an Asian background, right? Have, you know, yeah. so that's really key because sometimes we don't, um, there's some genes that are kind of more rare in certain race populations. Mm-hmm. And so we can't just look at someone or depending on what you put on the form, it may be relevant to you to test that or maybe not. So we can't yeah. just look someone visually and do that. So I bring that up because it, it just, 
has been talked about before. So yes, yeah. diversity and inclusion is really key. I'm and not I think sure. It's that. It, I think if once we get to a point, right, where we have the true diversity and inclusion, I think we'll be able to come up with more advanced research. You know, I think oh, even definitely. pharmacogenomics, you know, as we get more information from other people, as people report side effects or adverse effects, however you want to phrase it, you know, we build that database that eventually then benefits the rest of us. So I think the research is is hugely important in mm -hmm. having everybody involved. Because again, there was a study that was I think it said by 2030 that 80% of the U.S. population would be mixed. And so wow, I believe it. <laughs> right. And so how do we how do we approach that? And especially with yeah. medications, right? We're talking yeah. about pharmacogenomics here. And I think a lot of, you know, us with different backgrounds are going to metabolize a lot of these compounds very differently. Yeah. And so how can we kind of avoid some of the pitfalls that that will happen with a lot of these populations before it actually happens? Yeah, exactly. The before is the key part, right? Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. a, We're such yeah. a reactive, you know, society when it comes to medicine. Yeah, because it's just easier, Christine. You yeah. gotta I mean, it's just easier. It just is. Wait, to, wait until something happens and then you do something about it, right? <laughs> it's easier, I had, right? I had but our twelve year old it, it is. I had our twelve year old, like I have to remind her every morning, uh, we have twelve and a ten year old. Hey, did you take your multivitamin? It's not and did you take your multivitamin this morning? She's like, but it's not doing anything. Why am I taking it? I'm like, oh my gosh, we have to have this conversation. So it's kind of preventative, <laughs> like so it's just but funny. I think that has a lot to do with the education and awareness and how we approach is. issues, right? Yep. Same with, with your daughter, right? I was never when I, 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 for a long time, and I hate to admit this publicly, but I will. Uh oh. I tried to manage my medications on my own in my 20s, right? I didn't hear that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think a lot of people do, right? Yes. And so I think knowing that that happens, you know, and really educating people along the way, right? A lot of these medications that we're taking, you don't see an immediate reaction, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people will just say, well, what's the point of taking it? Yep. But then don't see, you know, 20 years down the line, had you taken this, you know? <laughs> exactly. No, that you're, you're right. You're right on that. Yeah, you're right on that. So uh, along that, um, I think you were on, I'll say, I, I know you had discussion with Christine Ashcraft. She's one amazing person and admirer in the PGX space. I should put that out there. But you posted <laughs> on LinkedIn, I believe, to tell us about, you were talking about PGX and drug discovery. I Do was. You, yeah, so, so tell I, us I did that. it and I did it in three posts on LinkedIn because I wanted to cover different perspectives, right? Okay. So my first post was around just me testifying and the the personal benefits that I received from PGX. My second post was around the drug discovery process, right? Because mm -hmm. working in the clinical trial space and hearing conversations and and then being exposed to precision medicine myself, right? Conversations with Christine and others in that space really opened to my eyes to, you know, maybe it is just a dosing problem with some of these drugs, right? right. That potentially they are the best drug for me, but because I metabolize this compound in this way, maybe we adjust the dosing and it works great for me, right? And mm -hmm. so... A lot of that and those conversations kind of really made me question, why don't we use this in the drug discovery process, right? For a test that now is fairly inexpensive compared to where it was 10 years ago mm -hmm. and, and have that potential benefit for these companies, right? In addition to the patients as well, if you could find out that someone maybe metabolizes the CYP compound rapidly, how do you adjust that dose or give them a different form to bring that drug to market? And, and so I think there's things that we really don't think about in all aspects of healthcare. I also put up a third post in response to that for the payer side of it. Right. And really looking at not the 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 cost of the test, but the benefits, right? Of really I have joint replacements. It was avascular necrosis, which caused my joints to die off. 
And in that process, three joints had to be replaced, but that's also going to result in multiple other joint replacements as time goes on. And so with a simple adjustment of that medication, not that we had the technology at the time, I'll go back and say that, but we do now. And so someone that may have that same reaction as I do, instead of continuing to give them the medication and just waiting for a response, will know how it's working in their body and be able to really prevent some of these issues from happening. So I think looking at PGX, mm -hmm. we have to look at it from every aspect and every benefit this can provide. Because I hear a lot about financial, right? And oh, mm -hmm. it's, you can't run these tests. But if you look at the cost right now, I think PGX is $250 if you were to pay individually. So is $250 worth more i mean is is that worth saving thousands or millions of dollars down the line yeah for sure and if you think about it i had just discussion with someone else is um you know it's also how we verbalize and, and process the word cost right yeah there's a cost in 250 for some people it can be a lot of money right however yeah. we have to think about is now it's more accessible to multiple different types of people with different financial financial aspect aspects right so before it was maybe thousands of dollars I, i'm not sure but now it's actually much cheaper so there's more access to a lot more individuals and depending on where you get the testing done you have um obviously various ranges of cost to it but also financial support or financial uh, support from some of the labs that you get the testing done, depending on where you get it. So it's it's a lot more, the point is a lot more accessible to a variety of different people with uh, out there before yeah. it was not. So I, I, now, think, I think about it that way. Yes, the cost oh, yeah. is there, right? But it's more accessible now. Oh, yeah. And, and also, if you look at, you know, with AB 425 that just passed through, that was that's giving access to medical patients and so if you look at our populations of medical they are on numerous amounts of drugs right don't live in the best situations and really wouldn't have access to that type of test otherwise right and so with those you know i'm one of those people right at multiple medications i'm on medicare myself um luckily was able to get that test through a private program but the benefits have have gone over and passed that program. Right. And for people who may not know, they probably everybody does may not know Medi-Cal. Is it the Medicaid version in California? Is that what it is? Yes, it is. Okay. We want to be different and on our own. So I you know. know. Y'all are different, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but That's we awesome. but a different way of thinking here, right? And really right. on how do you incorporate that technology into healthcare? You know, and, and technology has been around for a long time here. So I think people are more open to the ideas of implementing it. And there's not as much of a fear around things like this. Right. So is that partly what you were talking about? You were testifying. Is that uh, the California Health Committee? Yeah, that, that was for the was? California Health Committee for Pharma Assembly. Yeah, yeah. It was called, what, what was it called? Pharmacogenomics Advancing Total Health for All Act. Yeah, they uh PAC. PAC. Yes. I was gonna say yeah. there was an acronym that was easier than saying the whole thing, but PAC, yes. We have to have acronyms for everything, don't we? <laughs> that is true. I have noticed that. That is true. Yeah, but I think you know, having access at that level, I think can show the rest of the industry how this could work for general populations and really mm -hmm. show those benefits. Yeah. So is, is that how you're reaching more people to educate them? So people meaning, you know, patients such as yourself, you know, it could be payers, it could be clinicians, it could be a hospital group, it could be anybody. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's just, um, it's still a lot of people may not know what pharmacogenomics is. That And a lot of physicians as well, you know, um, one of the things that I was just recently hospitalized and I have my PGX results and I came in asking for diluted by IV. <laughs> and oh, if, nice. <laughs> right, if like, you know, <laughs> right. If you know your, your pain meds, you know that that's a highly potent drug. And most mm -hmm. people 
who come and ask for that are usually regarded as a drug seeker. Yep. I wasn't going to say it, Christine. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I don't look like, you know, your typical patient. I, I look yeah. normal. Right. And so, and I compartmentalize pain very well. I've been in pain since I was a kid. And so with that in mind, I took myself to the ER for extreme pain. I don't show it in my face or anything else, but I am in pain. I took myself there and that in itself is a whole journey, but got in and, and told this doctor that's what I needed. And then it kind of, you know, there was a little power play there. Yeah, um, He wasn't familiar with pharmacogenomics. He wanted to know why I was asking for Dilaudid and why I wouldn't <laughs> take, you know, uh, just what he was prescribing. Um, and then I was asked where I got this test done. And and then there was kind of, you know, that that power struggle between the two of us. And I think as we're educating patients around these resources, we also have to make sure we're educating physicians at the same time. Yes. And so doing that, I think it it has to be a partnership, right? It, it can't be just a patient or just a physician or just a payer. This needs to involve everybody. Yeah. So did you win that battle? I, I did, ask. you know, I did. And actually it, okay. was, it ended up really well. So okay, great. What happened was. So you carry your little, what do you call it? The PJ oh, wallet well, card what, thing <laughs> with you everywhere? That's a whole nother story. Cause I was going to a hospital where I knew it was in my records. Although uh, uh, Stanford okay. uses Epic and it is not easily accessible in the records at this time. Although I hear they're working on that. Um, and so part of this power struggle was me actually having to ask this doctor go to go back into my notes to February of 2019 and find this note from this other physician. Wow. But see, you had to do all that work. How many individuals do you know, like, like yourself, are going to do the research, going to do the test, taking it with them, educating the clinician to get to the right medicine, right? Not it, many. Right. And not many so, even really know how they would have that conversation with, yes. yeah, you know. And so I think opening those lines of communication is going to be extremely essential as we move forward. Yeah. But I, I and I think involving the pharmacist as well, you know, uh, my other thing. And so the story ended up um I asked the physicians if I could talk to them for a few minutes afterwards as I was being discharged. I could tell there was tension because, you know, then they were coming in. I had, you know, made a little stink about it on LinkedIn and, and was giving <laughs> comments and I'm sure they were as well. And I, I, could, I could see, I could, while you're, well, I'll let you finish your story, but I have to say oh. what my vision is while you're telling this story, you're, you're all good. You got your Dilaudid IV, you're all good pay, out of pain. And then you hold up the whole hospital, you get onto the <laughs> counter and like, Hey, I'll listen. And then everyone's like, Oh my gosh, she has, she has spoken. That's the vision I have right now. And I can see you saying that. Well, it was but go great, ahead. right? Because I, 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 I asked him if he would sit with me and talk for a minute, you know, and I said, look, I understand your frustration and, and where you're at. Right. I said it, my records weren't easily accessible and, and I have some information that you don't, I said, but you also have to realize that as a patient, I'm still undiagnosed and my doctors and I have been working on me for 47 years and you wow. came in with a couple hours experience and made your assumptions and called my doctor behind my back and did all of these things <laughs> when all we needed to do was have a conversation. And I apologized, right? I said, I'm, I'm, I was frustrated. I'm in pain. I'm in an ER. I brought myself here and you didn't hear me. And so wow. I said, I'm sorry if I did not, you know, portray what I needed to say in the right manner, but I'm frustrated and in pain. And he ended it with actually understanding, right? And saying that he would take it into account more, that there are patients out there who are more educated and that it was a shared decision-making when it came yeah. to these, right? Yeah. And so I think, I mean, I'm not sure how many patients would sit down and have that conversation. I think most would walk out angry and pissed off and just, you know, want to be done with it. Um but I really felt like there was a moment where we could have that 
conversation. Yeah, and, and I believe you probably had an impact on that clinician to the point where the next time they see a patient, they have you in the back of their mind, well, maybe let me look at this, or maybe there's something else. And so that's really um, all you could have done at that moment, you yeah. know? So I, I think that was impactful. It's one at a time, but you never know the conversation <laughs> that clinician will have with other clinicians when they have their, uh, you know, sitting around at a round table. So yeah. it's just, it just has to continue and people have to be open to it because there's a lot of clinicians or pharmacists, doesn't matter, I'm not pointing out to clinicians, but a lot of people that are set in their ways. Yeah. And so newer technology, we have to be able to use it as another tool to help our, um, you know, the community oh, as a yeah. whole. And our so. doctors are overrun, right? And really, how many have the time to sit and find out about these new mm -hmm. technologies and things that are coming out? They really don't have the time or the capacity. And so that's right. why I think patients can be more of a tool, right? In in kind of helping to to really solve these mysteries about our care if we are in that conversation in the right way. Yeah. And that's why there should always be a team of people. Everybody brings a different perspective into that um, space in alongside the patient, right? So yeah. Well, I wanted to bring up too, because, you know, we're talking on a pharmacy yeah. <laughs> podcast. And I, I think one of the important things too is, is really how essential a pharmacist becomes in this, you know, and and one of the discussions I had when I was being discharged, they, the, um, they called me, they wanted to go over my meds to make sure everything was okay. And I, I said, can you, I said, I have pharmacogenomics results. And I said, is there any way that I can get a PGX certified pharmacist huh. to go over my drugs with me? Nice. And I was told at the time though, that they didn't really have any available. And <laughs> so I think one of the other issues here is, is that there's a lot of pharmacists in the space, right? Who don't realize these drug gene interactions. And and Christine Ashcroft did a wonderful job of- She always of, does. Uh, right, I know. And, yeah. and she basically had said, if she was on, if her mother was on more than two medications or something, that she would want a PGX pharmacist on their team. Yeah. You know, and so thinking about how many medications each individual person takes, not taking into account how we metabolize them with our own genes, I think there's huge potential to build a relationship with a pharmacist and a patient and really kind of hone in on on how these drugs work, making sure patients understand them, understand the side effects, understand what to report if there are side effects, right? And really building a relationship around the, the medication that they're taking. Because I think so many people take medications, they stop taking them when they have effects for no reason, they don't finish antibiotics. Um, if they're on a maintenance medication, the second they feel better, they don't want to take the drug anymore, and then they start feeling sick. And I mm -hmm. think there's just a lot around medications that patients don't understand. It's great that we got the disease down, <laughs> yeah. but yeah. then how do you manage the treatments that are being offered? And how do you, how do you treat your diseases without causing other comorbidities? Yeah, or how comorbidities can cause other issues that we may not see, right? Right, and so, you know, you talk about a pharmacist in that space. Yeah, there's still a lot of pharmacists that may not uh, know about pharmacogenomics, in, but, you know, if they understand their kinetics, the pharmacokinetics and the dynamics of a medication, how it's working, but also not taking one medication at a time, but mul how multiple medications also work together, right? So that's another yeah. aspect that we have to look at. But again, um, from a pharmacist perspective, since you brought this up, yeah, um, just, you know, we say this a lot uh, on our podcast, just getting a CE in um, 
pharmacogenomics does not really make you an expert. It is really a path to get there. It, it's a learning process, right? Yeah. I've been doing this for a while and it's still a continuous learning, you know, right? So yeah. getting the certification, so you're familiar with the, the language that you're going to use, or like you said, how to speak with, uh, you know, your peers potentially or a clinician. So you get the language down and then you continue to learn. You get with uh, someone who's practicing in the field, right? You know, mm-hmm. seeing it, looking at it, reading it, understanding it, relating it that to the patient and understanding what does that look like where you have this um, report and then now you have a patient next to it. How do you connect the dots? So all those things really come with practice in maybe shadowing someone who's already doing it. So, right. Yeah. So we need, uh, yeah, you're completely right. We need pharmacists more in that space because we are the, and I'm, I'm not saying genetic specialists can't be that or PhD, but since we're focusing on PharmDs, you yeah. know, that, they're really the medication expert, understanding medications, and then you add genetics to it, right? Genetics uh, to it. And then you have... um the patient perspective that we have. So it's like a really great role for a pharmacist to take on, but it has to be done correctly. So, you know, yeah. but yeah. The, it has to be that team, right? And I think- Yeah, the team. I think mm-hmm. the other thing that we've discussed too was, I don't think people realize how much education you guys go through. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, yeah. yeah you know, yeah. I mean, being a pharmacist is not an easy thing. And I think with- not like CVS or Walgreens are bad or anything, but I think sometimes having that storefront gives people an idea that a pharmacist is really just kind of dispensing pills. And so- yeah, right. Well, <laughs> dispensing pills or what? What did, what did they call them a while back? Uh, uh, put a label on it or something? <laughs> stick, stick a label, whatever. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, I, I used to work at a retail. I, I cannot say, I cannot say, honestly, I will go back, but I can, I don't regret my time there. There's so many things that I learned that I could have not learned afterwards, right. Without being yeah. to, through the retail it's the number one place that we see our customers. We call it customers. The people we're trying to impact or touch, those are the number one place that they have access to us. Right. So yeah. now whether we get, I get, you know, I was getting paid for my consult service or not that was my role was to help the patients right so yeah Yeah. the dynamics is not so great I get that but I would really not exchange my um experience there you know uh, learning a lot about how medic what medications come across and prescribing habits of clinicians you know understanding how you talk to a patient that's coming up to pick up prescription time management how do you do five things at the same time while you're (laughs) trying to do one other thing you know all those skill sets I I don't think people realize their skills Oh, yeah. And I think also interacting with the public in a retail environment is very different than if you're in a pharmacy setting. Yes. You know, or a hospital setting or or any other setting, any other setting that's specifically dedicated to medication versus, you know, a retail location. I, I think it's a great resource. Right. But I do. I do think it kind of diminishes that that role in people's eyes. And so how do you bring the pharmacist back or bring them into that conversation. Yeah. And, you know, we've had, um, I've had work with pharmacists in the retail setting or I've had her, you know, my older family members and they want to go to, and I'm making up a name, right? Jessica <laughs> in this retail pharmacy, because that's their pharmacist, because why they, they, they have they like, like they have questions, like they, that's the number place, number one place they go to, um, and, you know, they talk about their, uh, you know, birthday that was coming up or an anniversary they had. So they had that co- connection with their pharmacist at that, um, retail store. So they wanted to go back there. So, you know, building yeah. that relationship really is really key, right? So yeah. instead of it's just here's your exactly. and the communication, right? Yeah, I get so passionate about this topic. I feel like I can't even speak anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, I love talking about it so you know yeah, you I, I just find me for a conversation yeah on it. <laughs> yeah there's there's a lot of things in retail I think pharmacists if if they're there they need to be proud of it's it's it is a skill set uh right yeah. but uh, if you don't like it you can get out but it is a it is a good place to be um or to help the patients is, is it's all a really good that. Yeah, it's a really good place, I think, to get to know your community. Yes. Now that's a, you know, you could have just said that and 
you know, I didn't have to talk for two minutes not knowing what I was saying. <laughs> yes, thank you for that. Yes, it is. Yeah. But I think you know, as we as we get into these spaces where there is this these precision medicine tools, we should be using them. Yes. You know, I, I look at how many people I know, how many lives have been lost, how many people who have been damaged when it could have been avoided. And I think that's the thing we don't think about. And I I don't know if you ever heard the story about Ford Motor Company and the Pinto. Did you ever hear about oh, that? I want to say I do because I don't want to be behind, but I have not. <laughs> well, it was in an economy <laughs> class, an economics class that I had in junior college. Oh, yeah. And so I can say no. Yeah. So it was like in the, I think it was in the seventies and the Ford had developed a Pinto that it later came out that if it was rear ended from a certain, at a certain angle or whatever, the entire car would explode, killing the occupants. And so Ford Motor Company had to make a decision at the time. Did they pay out and recall all of these cars or did they just not recall the cars and pay out for the lives that were lost? Hmm. They they ended up, it was a whole big thing, right? It was the wrong decisions um, and a lot of legal. Um, but I look at pharmacogenomics in that same way, right? We mm-hmm. know that these things can happen. It will happen, right? We don't know the percentage of people who it will happen to because we're not that far along in science yet. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if we're looking at pharmacogenomics now and we say that, what is it? 99% of people will react to at least one, you know, Mm -hmm. compound differently. And if you take that into consideration and you think about what we will have to pay out for damage, I don't think it's worth it to not roll out that safety net. Yeah, definitely. It's is no brainer. Right. And I I just I think that a lot of people see this differently depending on what part of the industry they they work in. And they may only hear about, you know, maybe their conversations are only on ROI for this certain aspect, but they don't see the full benefits that this could provide. Yeah. I agree with you. I agree. We do have to have you back, Christine. Promise me you'll come back. I will come back. I okay, will talk thanks. about any topic. I you want, want to make sure I get that in recording. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just like like we talked last time. We just we just can't get enough of talking. I, I really oh. don't. Yeah, but I want to make sure people know where to reach out to you and sure. what's the you know. There's a lot of key messaging. There. This is probably a bad question to ask. What is the key <laughs> thing you want? What's the one key thing you want people to take if they didn't really listen and they came on the last end of the podcast? On the last like, end of this. a lot. You know, I just want to hear what she has to say at the end. <laughs> I would say that we have a lot of innovation and technology out there, um, and so we have to really find a way to to use that technology in healthcare, but in a way that really does still include that empathy. You can so, it any more perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I could that could be the title of our podcast. Hey. No. <laughs> <laughs> well thank I, you. I Christian. could talk for hours though. And oh, I, I know. I, I think that it's great that's forum that you have and being able to bring in different perspectives so that people can see and hear because not everybody relates to one story. But yes. if you have different people telling the same story in different ways, I hope that one day everybody gets it. <laughs> and they will. And they will. And I appreciate you appreciate you coming on the podcast. Is is so wonderful speaking with you before the podcast, during the podcast, and I'm sure yeah. after the podcast. So I appreciate you, Christine. Thank you. And thank you for having me. It's so important what you're doing. Well, thank you. We, we try. And thank you for listening for PGX for Pharmacist Podcast on Pharmacy Podcast Network. There's no other place for all your PGX needs. We do a lot of PGXing on here, the science, the business, the reimbursements piece of PGX. So we want to hear from you. Let us know what you're thinking by leaving us a review or let us know what else you want to hear on our next episode. Thanks for your interest in PGX and for spending some time with us. 
please share this podcast and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. For all of our episodes, please visit pgx4rx.com. That's pgx4rx.com.